this is a thought-provoking topic and a difficult one to talk about, and I guess uh, I have a few bees in my bonnet, and I'm going to be slightly polemical and possibly pick a fight with a few economists. Um, I was asked to talk about a, a vision for a well-adapted society, uh, Australian society. So I'm going to be slightly polemical. I want to start by recalling a famous quote from Margaret Thatcher, who said in 1987, there's no such thing as society. Now, the left takes this quote out of context and, and has made a lot of uh, mileage out of this ever since. But it does open up attention in the way we think about society and in turn then what we might think about an adapted society. The point of Thatcher's quote was to say that people shouldn't rely on others for their well-being, and nor, in Thatcher's view, should the people rely much on the state for their well-being. The context was important. Uh, under Thatcher, Britain took a neoliberal turn uh, of a kind that hadn't really been seen anywhere else in the world except in Chile, and during that period of time, similar reforms to the political economy of the state were going on in New Zealand and the United States. So what is neoliberalism? In its purest sense, it's a it's a theory of political economy that says that human well-being is best advanced through three markets, free trade and institutions that protect private property rights. In this view of the world, the state exists to secure the freedom of capital, to provide the legal guarantees, the policing uh, structures necessary to secure private property rights so that capital can do what it does best, which is interpret market changes and respond in kind. OK, so what's this got to do with a well-adapted society? Well, this is all about society. If we understand society as a group of people who share a common culture, a territorial area, and feel themselves that they belong to a distinct social entity, uh, and that's what nationalism gives us, it gives us a sense of society whether we believe it or not, and, and we might debate this, but we do talk about an Australian society, and I'm going to talk about an Australian society here. Now one of the things that we share as a society in Australia, one of the things that binds us together is the Australian state. The state here, I mean, is a set of institutions that make the rules that govern our society. It's more than government, but government's certainly central to it. And we have a pluralist state in Australia, which means that, in effect, the state is a social contract between us as individuals and the governments that govern us. We relinquish certain rights and control over certain things in exchange for the provision of certain public goods that are most efficiently applied by the state for most of us. OK, so policing, we need a state to keep us safe. And environmental equality, that's what we look to the state to do. Public education, public health care, roads, advanced medical services. We look to governments to provide these things. They're called public goods. Social justice is also a public good. Now, the thing about these neoliberal reforms that occurred under Thatcher, and which I think we may be seeing somewhat in Australia, is that they changed this social contract that binds us as a society through the relationship of the state. These reforms tend to mean that governments do less of what they're supposed to do, which is provide public goods. So they lead to changes that undermine the provision of these public goods. We see the deregulation of markets and certain things that we maybe perhaps would like to see slightly more regulated, labour markets perhaps. We see the privatisation of publicly owned utilities like electricity, transport and water, and we think about our Ash Wednesday fires and understand what the privatisation of electricity markets got us in Victoria. We see the use of markets to allocate public goods. Carbon is a public good, but we're effectively creating a market to allocate carbon. Water, I would argue, is a public good. Others will argue with me. We're creating markets to allocate water, and we're seeing reductions in social services. So the result of these reforms, you might be surprised to know, is increasing inequality. In the USA, under a period of neoliberal reform from 78 to 99, the share of the top 0.1% of society, the share of that country's wealth doubled actually it tripled from 2% to 6%. Top 0.1% of society owns 6% of wealth in the United States, and that occurred during a period of neoliberal reform. In the UK, during the same period of reform, the share of the top 1%, the 1% wealthiest members of society's share of national wealth doubled to 13% by the end of the year 2000. In New Zealand, similar levels of accumulation of wealth at the top 1% of society. So the analysis of these neoliberal reforms says that it's strongly associated with the reconstitution of class and the transfer of wealth to elites. Bear with me, there's a point to this. Our governments have neoliberal proclivities. Even if they're not evenly applied across sectors and the fervour waxes and wanes according to the characteristics of government. But there is a trend over time in Australian political economy. Markets rather than regulation are allocating public goods, water and carbon. Important public services like energy, telecommunications, transport, water are being handed over to private enterprises. 
there's an ongoing push for the transfer of the delivery of education and healthcare into private sector providers. Think about the attacks on Medicare and the debate over Medicare. We're seeing ongoing efforts to constrain the independence of the public service and that essential role of the public service in a democratic state is being fundamentally attacked over many decades, I would argue. And we're seeing threats to social services, support for migrant communities, support for remote indigenous communities. And in Australia, since the 1980s, the richest 1% of the population has doubled its share of national income. They now control 10% of national income. While for the poorest 10% of society, their share of national income fell by 10% over that period of time. So all this suggests that to me that we're not likely to be a well-adapted society into the future on the current trends because we're under-investing in the capacity of whole swathes of our society to adapt. Because we're leaving behind segments of those society to fend for themselves under a changing climate and in a retracting state. Because we're transferring control of important services that we might want to adapt to climate change into the hands of private operators who have no concern for the provision of public goods under deregulated markets. And we're also allocating the options to profit from climate change to an elite that can own those firms, profit from those markets. And we're doing all this without much comment, without much debate, or without much resistance. And with this view, I think as researchers, we're sometimes fiddling with the technicalities of adaptation while ignoring the big institutional determinants of what's driving our society here. Okay, so a vision. In that context, I guess I'm saying that a well-adapted society is not one that is run by treasury. Describing a characteristic of a society that adapts well in five minutes isn't easy, but let me say a few things. I think that we should think of adaptation not as a set of finite outcomes, but as a process. That is, instead of aiming to be successfully adapted, we should be aiming to adapting well as a process. And I think there are five features to a society that would adapt well. First is, I think fairness would be a social goal of adaptation. In this conference, I've heard an awful lot about efficiency and effectiveness in terms of adaptation, but we don't talk about equity anymore. Two years ago, we were talking about equity as a, as a goal of adaptation. Equity has to be a goal of adaptation if we are to be a society. If it's not, there's no such thing as society in my view. So equity in terms of outcomes, by which I mean we should be striving to ensure equal opportunities in terms of access to basic services like education, healthcare, information, communication, technology, and work. There should be no discrimination in access to work and access in terms of processes where people are given equal choice, where equal voice, where values are debated, where decisions are transparent and justified, and where the winners and losers from policy decisions are made transparent. Secondly, I think we would have a clear articulation of the public goods that are at risk from climate change and the role of government and their responsibility with respect to the protection of those public goods. There are things that are at risk from climate change, like water, coasts, health, food production, critical infrastructure, social justice. These are all public goods. Are these the goals of adaptation policy? They should be the goals of adaptation policy. We have governments to provide and protect those public goods for us. Are we seeing adaptation policies that are articulating those public goods as goals of those policy responses? We're getting silence. So this might require a bit more from governments than privatisation, creating markets, ensuring themselves against indemnity, providing information about risks and removing economic barriers to adaptation. It might require significant political leadership. It might require cooperation between all levels of government and the use of a full range of policy instruments, including strategic planning and regulation, across a broad spectrum of portfolios uh, in order to achieve clearly articulated policy goals. We don't have these at the moment. A third element of this, I think, is that local governments would be recognised in the Constitution. If adaptation is occurring from the bottom up and local governments are doing the heavy lifting, then they need a statutory mandate to do so. Their roles and responsibilities need to be constitutionally recognised and they need to be appropriately funded to do the work that they're supposed to be doing. The fourth thing is I think that we'll be thinking about responsibility as an element of, of who we are as a society, that, that the notion of citizenship should be fundamentally tied up with notions about responsibility to help others within our country and to help others within our region. And, and I want to, to get us to think for a minute, uh, you may have heard me say before, that when we think about adaptation in this country, we sort of assume that we don't live in the world. But actually, we're an economy that exports almost everything we produce. We're a multicultural society. Our ability to adapt to climate change is going to be fundamentally determined by where we sit in the region and the world economy. And we have a responsibility in our region as well. That though we might think we're victims of climate change and we're, going to, we're very vulnerable, we're actually much more fortunate than others in our region and we have a responsibility to them too. We should be leading in this respect as well. And there's a number of things we could do that come to very little cost to most people in this country. We could create a common labour market between Australia, New Zealand and the small states of the South Pacific. 
would not make much difference to our economy, would be very good for them. We could actually make a significant national investment in clean energy and energy research and development and, and significantly invest in this to make this technology affordable, to reduce our emissions and to transfer that technology into our region. We could reduce tariffs on imports from developing countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. These things don't cost us very much. They're reasonably sensible things to do. Finally, I think a well-adapted society would be one where we actually make strategic plans, both in terms of specific sectors of our economy um, and particular places. At the moment, we think that flexibility in our economy is a good thing, and to some degree it certainly is, and, and governments are very keen to respond to the whims of electorates through push-polling, and those things have their virtues, but they come at the cost of strategic planning to respond to the future. Our population, our economy, our workforce, our cities, our coasts, our water resources, our farming and fishing sectors require visions of the future and plans to achieve them. And plans to achieve them that account for climate change. And there may also be places and regions in our country that are particularly at risk of climate change that require concerted attention from brave and engaged political leaders to help them transform in ways that make them sustainable into the future. People in the Tri Valley in this state have been waiting for government to come and talk to them and it just isn't happening. There's a need for a transition there and for a plan and a serious form of government engagement with those people. So to conclude, let me say two things. The stealthy neoliberal reforms underway in Australia and the kind of nature of the discussion we seem to be having at the Commonwealth level in Australia are probably inimical to successful adaptation for anyone other than the extremely wealthy in this country. They don't point to a vision of society, they point to a vision of an adaptive economy. And the second point is that a society that adapts well is one where the social contract between the society and the state is recognised and renewed. I think we need to rethink what we have governments for, kind of like people renew their marriage vows. What do you guys do again? And what do we give you? And what's your role? The role of governments is to provide public goods. If they don't provide public goods, we don't need them. Fairness, responsibility and the protection of public goods would be key values that inform policy and planning, transparency and coordination would be the hallmarks of government. Thanks.